This satisfying animation has been blowing up social media with millions of views. It's incredibly frustrating while being satisfying at the same time. I love it and I hate it, but mostly it just hurts my brain. Like how does the gap never fill? And why don't those distant mountains ever get closer? It almost drove me to insanity until I broke it. Broke it all down in Blender, that is, and came to the realization that once you understand the formula that's going on here, it's actually pretty quick and easy. And this video is going to show you just how to do it. This video is sponsored by HP and their Z4 Intel workstation. More about that later on in the video, but you can check it out right now with the links in the description. After doing tons of my own testing in Blender with different values and numbers, I discovered that this is actually just the Fibonacci rule sequence. That was obviously already discovered by somebody much smarter a long time ago. So what is the Fibonacci sequence rule? That's too confusing for this video. Basically, the sum of these two cubes equal that cube, and it's a never-ending spherical that continues on for Forever and ever, and that's why it makes for such a good, frustrating, satisfying animation. So without further ado, let's get started in Blender. As always, you can download the finished Blend file for this project on Patreon, and for just three bucks, gain access to every new and old project ever on the channel. Using Blender 4.2 or newer, all you default cube lovers can rejoice, because this tutorial is the default cube's chance to shine. What you need to do first to this cube is transfer the origin point to the corner of the cube. So you tap into edit mode on the cube, grab a vertex in the corner, and go shift S cursor to select. Then you tab out of edit mode, select object, and choose set origin to 3D cursor. Now you can see when you rotate the cube, it's going to be rotating around that top corner point. This is going to be way easier for distributing our cubes. So hitting number pad 1 on your keyboard to jump to front view, you want to grab the cube and slide it all the way down to the red axis. So hitting G, Z, and then holding control to snap it to the grid. Then hitting 7 on your number pad to jump to top view, you're going to go shift D and make a second one of these cubes. You're going to scale this by hitting S to the magical Fibonacci number sequence 1.618. Then you can hit G and Y to grab this cube and move it along the Y axis. Zooming in with your scroll wheel and placing it directly right on top of the following cube. Then it's just repeating the process, hitting Shift D to duplicate, hitting S to scale to 1.618, this time hitting G and X to move it along the X axis to the left and lining it up right in line with our previous cube as close as possible, zooming in nice and close. You might see a pattern here. You can see after duplicating four of these cubes, we have a rectangle and all we're gonna do is continue that same process to expand expand this rectangle bigger until we have 10 cubes placed in our scene. We have the Fibonacci sequence spiral. Super simple, and because we placed the origin point at the top of the cube, we have it all flat on top here, ready for our animation. What's the next step, you might ask? Well, that's gonna be adding some animation. And to do this, we'll start by placing our camera. So grab the camera in the scene, position your viewport where you want the angle of your animation to take place, and hit Control alt number pad zero. This will snap it right to your viewport, and you can hit number pad zero to jump to your camera view. Then for this animation, I went to the camera setting and made it 1080 by 1080, so we have a square. We're gonna have four cubes being animated in this animation, and each cube animation is gonna be approximately 100 frames, so I'm setting my timeline to 400 frames. Now that we have 10 cubes created, you'll wanna transfer the origin point back to the center in all these cubes. So select them all, and then go Object, and choose Origin to Center of Mass Volume, so we can rotate them for animation. Then I found it actually easier to kinda of animate this whole sequence in reverse. So I'm gonna to jump to the end of my timeline at frame 400, and select our our smallest cube in the center. On frame 400, you'll hit G and Z and slide it up, holding control to snap it right to the surface of our cubes. Make sure you're happy with the camera angle at this point. This will be important because you won't want to have to mess with the camera view later on. Then you can add your first keyframe for animation by selecting the cube, hitting K on your keyboard, and choosing insert keyframe for just the location and rotation. Then, like I said, this cube will have 100 frames of animation, so jump backwards in your timeline to frame 300, hit G to grab the cube along the Y axis, and pull it till it's all the way out of camera view. Then you can do some rotation by hitting R and Z to rotate it on the Z axis and hit K again and insert location rotation again. Now if you play your animation from frame 300 onwards, you can see we have the cube come sliding in to our frame. It's really slow right now because your frame rate is probably set to 24 FPS in Blender. For a satisfying animation like this, you'll wanna crank it all the way up to 60 FPS. And we're on to animating our second cube. So select the next biggest cube on your rectangle of cubes, starting on frame 300. Pull it up along the Z axis. Here you wanna to jump to front view and make sure that you're moving it up along the Z axis right to the surface of your cubes. Once you get really close, go ahead and hit K to insert a location and rotation keyframe. Then move 20 frames forward in your timeline to frame 320 
and move that cube all the way down, zooming in from front view again to make sure you're moving it all the way down nice and flush again, and hit K, insert location rotation keyframe. Then jumping 100 frames back to frame 200, go to top view, move that cube along the X axis well out of the camera view, about the same distance as we did our previous one, add a little bit of rotation to it as well, and hit K to insert another keyframe. Here you can see, starting at frame 200, we have another bit of animation where it rotates and falls right into place. And as before, you probably see a pattern with this. You grab the next biggest cube. You can save yourself some time by putting in a keyframe at frame 220, move back to frame 200, pull it up so it's flush sitting on top of all the other cubes, insert your second keyframe, jump to top view, jump to frame 100, and pull it out of your view, adding in your final keyframe for this cube. And there you have your next bit of cubicle animation. With only one cube left to go, you'll repeat the process. Frame on 120, frame on 100, pull it up, jump to frame one, pull it out of the camera view, add some rotation, and add in another keyframe. And then there's only one final cube to animate, so grab the next biggest cube, put in a keyframe at frame 20, and then at frame one, pull it up nice and flush, add in your final remaining cube. And this one's gonna be our looping cube, the one that the animation starts with and stops with. And with that animation added, you can see we have all five cubes actually animating, which technically will look like four because the first cube and the last cube are gonna blend together seamlessly. And that looks really cool already. And you wanna know what's great for not only 3D animation, but also simulations, heavy 3D workflows and video editing? This video is sponsored HP and their best selling workhorse, the Z4 G5 Workstation. Powered by Intel Xeon C CPUs to handle heavy workflows with up to 24 cores, with massive expandability all the way up to 512 gigabytes of RAM, and up to two NVIDIA RTX 6000 ADA GPUs. And with all that, I was shocked that when I went to pick it up, how lightweight and compact it all was. It runs quiet with great airflow and over 20 smart fan sensors to adjust fan speeds in real time, with three preset modes to choose from, high performance, performance, or quiet mode, as well as awesome features like the option for front hot swappable NVMe devices, super fast USB-C at 20 gigabyte signaling rate, along with 10 gigabyte ethernet options, basically just a 3D creator's dream setup. You can check out HP's configurable Z4 workstations with the first link in the video description. Now, how do you make it loop, you might ask? Well, I did some testing and I started by thinking that I might have to animate the camera zooming in and then jumping back. But this presents some other issues within Blender because the sense of scale would be thrown off with any object lights you have in your scene. Also, the sense of scale is thrown off when you're dealing with your depth of field on your camera. So what we're gonna do instead is just scale all the cubes in relation to the camera. So it looks like the camera's moving, but actually the cubes are just scaling. To do this, you wanna set your scene up to do a basic quick test render right now at frame 400. Just positioning the lights so we have some harsh shadows. This will make it easier to line up our animation. Also. Also, it's smart to crank the resolution of your render up to 200% so we have some more detail in this image to work with. Then this test render you'll want to save out to your computer as your reference image. We'll use that in a little bit. Now it's time to create an object to parent all these cubes to scale with. So for this, what I'm gonna do is on frame 400, I'm just going to tab into edit mode on our smallest cube, grab the two vertices at the base of this cube, hit Shift D to duplicate them and hit P to separate this into a separate object. We'll go ahead and rename this something like our scale ref. Then tab into edit mode, select both those vertices and extrude them out along the X axis to perfectly fill our remaining rectangle hole here. Zoom in real close and make sure you get it exact. Now we don't want this to actually render. Now just for references sake, we'll give it a nice dark viewport material. And also don't forget to delete any keyframes off of this new rectangle mesh. Then in our inspector here and on frame 400 in your timeline, grab all of your cubes, then grab your scale object last and go control P, set parent to object. Perfect. Now all we have to do is scale all of these cubes down the appropriate amount. What is the appropriate amount you might ask? Well, using our same formula of 1.618. So because we're scaling four cubes worth down, I'm just gonna start with one. And when you take one, multiply it by 0.618 four times, you're left with the number 0 0.1458, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter after about four digits, that's all you really need. So take that number, 0.1458, hit K and insert a location and scaling keyframe on frame 400. Then you can jump back to frame one. And here we're just gonna hit S to scale by 0.1458. Go ahead and hit K to insert a location and scaling keyframe. And this is where you jump to your camera view by hitting number pad zero. Going into your camera settings, enabling background images, click add image, and then open up that reference image that you saved out. Hit Z and switch to wireframe mode so you can see the background image in your camera view. You can turn the opacity of this background image to one. Then we just have to position the scaling object along the X and Y axis 
to fit perfectly with frame 400. So to do this, just hit G and Shift Z as a little shortcut to move on the X and Y axis, but not the Z axis, and position your cubes to line up that gap just perfectly with the gap from frame 400. You'll want to zoom in and check all four corners to make sure you get this pretty exact. Get it as exact as you can, but really it's going to loop pretty seamlessly anyways. This is where the shadows in our reference image help to line this up just right. Then hit K again to insert a scaling and rotation keyframe. And now you can see when you jump from frame 1 to frame 400, the cube in the center doesn't move at all, which means it will loop seamlessly. Now the one thing that I can't really explain, but I can give you the solution to fix, is the animation for some reason starts off really fast and then slows down. Even if you go into your graph editor and change this to be linear, it has the same effect, which kind of confused me. But I found a solution for it to make it look very seamless. And that is select your scaling object, split your window to open up the graph editor, select all the graphs, and then right click and choose interpolation mode as the top easing option here, the sensuladal. Sensuladal. Sin Sin <laughs> Damn it, why is there something I always can't pronounce? Basically, this sets our animation to a curvular ramp now that offsets the weird speed ramping that was happening before, and as you can see, loops quite seamlessly now in our viewport. Another little tip is if you want the camera to pause a little bit every single time a cube drops, just go to frame 100, insert a location and scale keyframe, jump to 200, insert a location and scale keyframe, and with our new interpretation method set up, it will come to a pause, at every single cube drop and then start going again. So while I'm not gonna get into a ton of details on how you can render this now, cause you can do this any way you'd like, the way I like to render things is start with an HDR. I like to get them from Polyhaven because they're just awesome over there. So browse through some of the indoor Polyhaven HDRs because these look great with multiple light sources in them. Download one of them, then in the environment settings on Blender, open up an environment texture and choose that HDR. Change your render engine to Cycles, your device to GPU Compute. This will render way faster on the GPU. If you have an NVIDIA RTX A6000 GPU, like the HP Z4 Workstation does, you want to make sure that you're rendering on it because it will be super fast. To prepare your cubes for some great looking materials, grab one of them, switch to your modifier stack, and if you hit Control 2 on your keyboard, it will add a subdivision surface modifier. Just switch it to simple and then grab both the viewport and render and crank it up to six. Then selecting the cube with that modifier on it, select all of your remaining cubes and go control L, copy modifiers. Now all these cubes have the subdivision surface modifier applied to it and they're ready for materials. You can also use Polyhaven to find textures. Picking some cool looking wood materials from Polyhaven work great. And the cool thing about Polyhaven is that these materials are actually built and ready for Blender, as you can see here. So when you download and extract these, you can go into Blender and choose Append, select the texture that you downloaded and you'll find a blend file for it there. Just select the blend file, jump to your material and select the wood floor material in this case. Then select the cube that you want the material applied to, jump to your material settings and if you click the little option here, you'll find that the wood floor deck material is in Blender now here and if you select it, you can see that it's rendering nicely. If I split the window here and switch to the shader editor, you can see we have our PBR material already all set up for us in Blender. And you can adjust things here if you want, like the displacement scale or the vector scale. So I'm just gonna go ahead and repeat this process with some cool wood or brick materials from Polyhaven. If you're getting this low resolution shading on some of your objects, just select all the cubes, right click and choose Shade Smooth. Now the only thing you have to keep in mind with adding these materials to our animation is that they loop with frame one to frame 400. So basically just start on frame 400, add your four different materials in for these cubes, then jump to frame one and make sure that the cubes in the right location have the same material as they do at frame 400. You can just check this by jumping back and forth from frame one to frame 400. And you can see here that I've applied the same material to both these cubes. And that wraps up the tutorial. I went ahead and had fun making all kinds of different variations of this satisfying animation. Here I did one with brick textures that looked pretty cool, getting a different colored brick for every cube. I love it when they have some nice displacement to it. it looks really cool on the distant textures. Here's one that I really like that I did with snow and ice materials. Basically just these ice cubes building out this continually never ending winter. Kind of how it feels like for me sometimes living up north in the US in a very cold climate. Here's another one that I created using a combination of cobblestone, wood, planks, and dirt. Similar to the awesome animation initially created by Jake Fellman on YouTube and Instagram. But there's your finished satisfying animations. If you guys do create some cool satisfying animations, I love seeing them more than anyone else. So be sure to tag CG Geek. You'll find me on all those platforms and I'll definitely be able to find your videos too if you post them. So that would be totally awesome. But that's gonna do it for me guys. I'll see you all in a future video. Bye bye!